And Officer, Wildlife Officer Gregory Randall is here. How long have you been with Animal Services and Wildlife Officer? Uh, 25, 24 and a half years. And for many of those years, the only Wildlife Officer? From was? 2005 till just 14 months ago. And that really is amazing because community after community has to varying extent uh, situations and issues and one person for much of that time responding to all those calls. For the entire city? For the entire city. So I feel very lucky that we have him here with us tonight. So uh, if I can ask you to go ahead and, and you're basically you're going to um, take some, uh, make a presentation, take some questions. Again, I'm going to urge everybody, there might be a diversity of views here, but to try to keep expressions of views and concerns and information about, oh, you saw something here or there, fairly quick if possible, because, and, and more importantly, civil, uh, because we really do want to, first of all, have this be a neighborhood watch meeting and, and, and uh, get, gifted with that spirit of neighborliness, but also we need to move through and hear hopefully from everybody. So the Prime Minister's appreciated. Thank you, Paul. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your busy evenings to be here. I'm um, Officer Gregory Randall, a wildlife specialist for the City of Los Angeles Animal Services. As Paul had mentioned, I've been doing this for some time. This is actually my 32nd year of working with animals professionally. Um, but with the, thank you. Um, I started with a veterinarian, like a pet hospital at the age of 16. Um, moved on to a pet pride pet care shelter that took care of over 300 cats, worked for a veterinary pharmaceutical company, worked for LA County Animal Control for a year, and I came here in this department in 1989. We started the wildlife program in June of 2002. Myself and Officer Boswell at the time worked the program. May of 2005, we both got offered a promotion, uh, but they told us the wildlife program would go away. So I refused my promotion, but thereby inherited the entire city instead of a new school town. So daunting task to say the least, uh, you know, 4 to 65.5 square miles and over 4 million people. Uh, 14 months ago, Officer Juan Vin joined me. Um, he's in training, right? He's not here tonight, he couldn't make it. Uh, but he will be helping me, he's learning the ropes about the wildlife program. Uh, and at some point, obviously, I'm not gonna be here, I'll be retired, and hopefully he'll be able to take over and, continue on with the program. Uh, the wildlife program was started to deal mainly with coyote issues, but we soon learned that there were a variety of issues, anything from raccoons and squirrels on up to mountain lions and bears and birds of prey and reptiles. So we help people with their particular issues regarding wildlife. Our job is not to remove urban wildlife from the city, but to educate people so they're less likely to have a negative encounter with that wild animal. Um, you know, there are agencies that do remove wildlife, they still exist, and that is an option that people have, but we encourage people to institute scare tactics and deterrence of property alteration before going to the extent of hiring a pest control company. Uh, well, the main reason that I'm here tonight, and a number of you have spoken to me, or my assistant, or have dealt with me in the past, uh, is coyotes. And right now, coyotes are very active. We've got coyote activity all over the city. Uh, the starting at the end of December was breeding time. Please have a seat. Um, they're not all going to find a mate. Uh, coyotes are monestrous. They only have one chance to breed for a year. They're usually in season for about a week. If they miss that chance, that's it. Um, you know, so they'll give birth to a litter of pups of maybe three to eight on average, March, April, or May. Um, depending on environmental factors, if the animals aren't doing so well, they have a smaller litter. Um, in some cases, the parent isn't very well at all, and none of them survive. There is a 67% mortality rate from birth to adulthood on coyotes and some of the other wildlife we have. Skunks, like 51 to 80%. It's just a variety of things that can cause them to die. So during the process of them needing to survive, we're coming into contact with them. They're showing up in our yards looking for things to eat. And it's not like they're necessarily seeking out what you're all concerned about here a pet. They're seeking out anything that fits the size, usually rodents, you know, rodents and also small mammals like uh, raccoons and skunks and opossums and really squirrels and uh, gophers and a variety of things, snakes, sometimes even scorpions. Um, and a lot of fruit, fallen fruit from trees, composted food items. They hunt through wooden brush piles for a lot of these rodents. And in the process of doing this, they might come across one of our pets. 
And the way in which we have our properties usually sets up a problem for our pets where we have a little yard or a big yard, whatever it is, and you have your pet back there. Maybe you've gone to work and the coyote's searching through and comes across that pet. Now the pet size tends to be, if they do go for a pet, usually under 20 pounds, but more so in the five to 10 pound range. They want something they can pick up or run away with. They're not seeking our pets out, it's just they're coming across them, okay? And one of the things they've learned is when they go through a neighborhood is if they see things that make them realize that there's another food source there. For example, if there's a colony of cats or someone's feeding a colony of cats, they might be attracted to that colony and, it's, and go after that colony of cats, as well as any food that might be left for, for them. Okay, if somebody leaves pets outside that normally would be indoors, like a hamster or something like that in a cage, or a bird in a cage, that might be an attraction source. And this is an area where we're always going to have coyotes. I mean, I grew up in this area. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I mean, my path home every, every day is Rowena, up around St. George, and down Franklin. Every single day, that's my way home. And I mean, that's been going on since I've been in this department. And I drive through your neighborhood on a regular basis as well as my own, and I see a variety of animals. And my concern that I see, and a lot of you may have seen this yourself, is a number of people that even though they may be aware of coyotes that have their small dogs off leash. Okay? Now, usually, when I see somebody with their dog off leash, this is what I see. The leash around the neck. And the dog's like 20 feet over there, and the person's texting. Okay, that is not not only safe, unsafe for your dog, for wildlife, but other animals, another dog, or possibly being hit by a car, which is one of the major reasons we lose our pets being hit by cars. Okay, so I do encourage people to follow the leash law. It is actually mandatory. There is a, a fine for that, but getting someone to stop you to cite you for not having your dog on leash is about the same as a police officer pulling you over for not using your turn signal because we just don't have the manpower. So you may, don't take that as an advice to go out and do it. I'm just <laughs> saying that the possibility someone might have time on their hands to give you a site, but most of our officers are on, our way, on their way to emergency calls, like animal abuse or hit by car, things like that. Um, so one of the main concerns that I got from this community was why are the coyotes coming down so much now? And it's, this is a, a seasonal thing. I mean, the activity goes in spurts. But right now, we're facing the biggest drought since 1888. We have less of a water source, less of a food source. The food that these animals prey upon in some of the areas they would normally be, which would be even in this community, tends to move on to wherever their food source is. So the smaller predators raccoons, skunks, and opossums, if they're not able to find the rodent population they want or whatever, they're gonna move on somewhere else. They're gonna to go to where it's more likely to be. They can smell. They smell where this food source is with their nose and they're gonna follow their nose. And the coyotes aren't finding those animals. They also, too, move to areas where that is. These are all animals governed by their stomachs. Okay, if they're not finding what they want, they're going to go somewhere else. But there's a lot of food sources here. Okay, during the time that I've done investigations, as well as Officer Din, who was asking me a lot of questions about things that he's seeing, which is Officer Randall, why do I see so much fruit on the ground in people's yards? Why aren't they picking that up? Or why do I see all the pet food out? And I explain it to him, and as I'm gonna explain here, we are creatures of habit. We get in our routine, we don't often follow through with what we should. We don't remember to pick up the pet food when the pet's not there to eat it. And a lot of times we don't pick up our fallen fruit. And that fermenting smell of that fruit is going to attract the animals around. The, removing it does not mean that your situation is going to be perfect. If you pick up the fallen fruit and get rid of the wood pile and the brush pile and all those things that I'm mentioning, you're going to reduce the likelihood of a negative encounter. But again, it's not going to be perfect. Just as if you hire a company to come and remove a coyote, even if that coyote is removed, another one may take its place. It may be a month, two months, or a year. Because animals fill an empty niche. And we do need all of these wild predators because they are an important part of the ecosystem to keep the rodent populations in check. In areas where they've removed a lot of predators, rodent populations have exploded, <coughs> causing more problems in the wildlife because a lot of rodents carry diseases that can affect us. Okay, so remember cause and effect. If you make a decision to go out and contract with a pest control company, 
which by the way can be anywhere from six hundred to forty five hundred dollars depending on who you contract with they may come out and set a trap they most of them trap for a period of ten days charge you the fee whether they catch anything or not and then charge you an additional fee to remove the animal okay pest control companies nuisance control company operators have a mandate from the Department of Fish and Game when they take their test and sign for trapping they have two choices, let the animal out of the trap on site or kill it. There is no relocation. <coughs> okay, why is there no relocation? The relocation of wildlife is more detrimental to the animal itself and other animals of that same type of population where they're moved to. For example, in the old days, and I mentioned early 90s, 80s, 70s, we used to do an airlift and take some of these animals to Angeles Press Corps. By doing so, we were translocating domestic pet disease that never existed there, especially parvovirus and distemper. Because what we see now is a trend of wildlife contracting domestic pet disease as opposed to domestic animals contracting wildlife diseases. It's gone the other, other way around. The other problem is we're not the only agency that was doing that. Other agencies were dumping their animals in the forest. We were overburdening the ecosystem. The animals that were already there grew up in a totally wild situation, and that's how they survived. The animals that grew up here are more like scavengers. They survive off of everything that we have. So you're taking it and dumping it into a foreign environment and say live. And also the other problem is we were taking away parent animals from their young. During this time of year, usually March or coming up next month through June, trapping an adult wild animal, no one checks to see if it's a female that, that's just given birth. That animal's moved, the babies die of starvation. Okay. These companies don't often follow through with making sure to pay, take the babies with the mom. If you have a mom, a, a baby raccoon or something, an adult raccoon removed from your attic during this time of year, March, April, May, if they don't take the babies out with it, the babies die in your attic. Another problem then develops. So part of what we do in mentioning all this is to try and help you through the problems. If you have an animal in your attic, an animal under the house, an animal entering your yard, we're going to teach you what to do to reduce the likelihood of that happening through aversion, property alteration, scare tactics. These are all things that are gonna work. Now, a lot of people are gonna say, I pay my taxes. I pay your salary. I pay my own salary. <laughs> okay, so I wanna make sure that I do the best job possible. And I'm not gonna to lie to you and tell you, do that X, Y, Z, and you'll never see the animal again. That's not true, that would be a lie. Do X, Y, Z, and you're less likely to have an ongoing problem is more likely, okay? Because we are part of the problem ourselves. You can have your yard pristine, but if a neighbor three doors down overflows their trash can and scatters cat food on the front lawn for the neighborhood cats, that's a problem. And there are people that do that, okay? I don't out people at meetings. I'm just saying we have <laughs> people that are doing that, okay? So just be aware, and there's nothing Nothing really wrong with taking care of a stray animal. I mean, I have cats. I love cats. I would never let them outdoors, mainly because as a child at age 11, somebody was putting radiator, radiator coolant in cat food to kill the cats in the neighborhood, and I lost my first cat that way. I've never had a cat outdoors since. It's not safe outdoors for cats, period. It is just not safe. Okay, but I don't want my cats, I don't want them to get in a fight with other cats and come home with an abscess. I don't want them to get attacked by a dog, and I don't want my cat to go out there and kill birds. Okay, I'm trying to be a responsible pet owner. A responsible pet owner keeps their cats in. Sorry, I'm not calling you irresponsible if you let your cat out. That's just my personal feeling. Keeps their dog on a leash when they're out taking their dog for a walk and picks up after the dog after it goes to the bathroom. Now, if you're out for a walk, you may have some concerns that when you're walking your dog that there may be a coyote. Okay, what do you do if it's one coyote, two coyotes, three coyotes? You're gonna do the same thing whether it's one or 10, okay? You're going to make yourself appear larger than the coyote and use scare tactics. But you've gotta be prepared just like you would if you were preparing yourself for an earthquake or a fire. You practice, okay? That means if you've got something with you and you're out for a walk, a lot of people say, well, what should I walk with? You don't have to do this one, but here's a leash. You've got an air horn. You got your hand through the loop, You've got the air horn right here in a little pouch. You can do a whistle. You can hook something on here with a whistle. But you've now got something. Your hands are still free to walk the dog, 
but you've got an air horn with you. You don't have to have this giant Aquanet sized air horn, <laughs> you know, but you have something to utilize. Walk with, get a backpack, a little pouch with a little air horn. And I know it's not that fashionable to wear a pouch these days, but you know, you can carry something in something else. The storm whistle, world's loudest whistle, okay? Any type of boating whistle is good. I will not blow them, okay? If you are out for a walk and you're carrying an umbrella, the good thing about an umbrella is you just made yourself look bigger. By popping the umbrella out in front of you and doing that, you're frightening the animal. You are very frightening. I tested that in Griffith Park on coyotes. It works really well. <laughs> this is, um, they now have this new air horn. I'm not gonna price it, but it's a pump action. You don't have to buy a refill, it never runs out. So this is a very good thing. Most party stores carry this. This is for home, for your wildlife aversion kit. Keep something like this at home and handy to use. A bullhorn, you can project your voice. If you're at home, you have a kit like this, you, you project your voice. Coyote's 40 feet away, you're putting your voice right in his face. Okay, you can yell at him to go away. All right. And some of you have probably seen me display this at some of the meetings. This is a, a girl's rhythmic gymnastics toy. <laughs> Believe it or not, these Mylar strips are really good for frightening wildlife. I bought this and I tested it in Griffith Park at a location where people were feeding coyotes at one of the benches near um, the Marigold Ranch. Um, and I sat there and I waited. And a, a good number finally came after about a half an hour. I think it was like eight or nine. And I stood up and I went like this. Gone. All of them in all different directions. Uh, bad news for the guy that was sitting in the outhouse with a skunk underneath, uh, which let off. And he came bolting out of there with his pants <laughs> off. So, the bathrooms were closed at the park and they had these outhouses there. I had no idea. Either, so. But anyway, um, really good deterrent. At the time it was funny, but I felt bad later. Uh, there are a variety of deterrents. If you've ever been camping, I'm sure in the middle of the night you've heard the infamous, I will bang them. You can bang these really hard, this banging of pans together to scare away bears. So basically it's about being prepared, having things handy, whether you're at home, having a smaller version of some of these things in your car, so that you have them handy at any time. And it's not just for the four-legged predators. We do have two-legged predators, which are more dangerous. Okay, and you're worried about what the news, because the hype of coyotes and what they'll do, they'll take your children and all this stuff and run away with them. You're more likely to have an encounter with a two-legged predator. Okay, it's, it's, it's a concern. You know, if you're out going for a walk, most of us, because of technology, are more distracted. Looking at that phone, texting, angry birds, or whatever game somebody might be playing. And the dog may have even slipped off the leash without you knowing, pulled out of the collar and is off which we've had happen. If you're out for a walk and you're walking by bushes or hedges and it's 11 o'clock at night, you might want to be aware to look or walk out and around before you just step past there. There could be a guy crouching back there that has learned your pattern that knows you walk your dog every night at 9.30, waiting for you. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm trying to tell you that's reality. It happens. Now with technology, we've got the two guys, one's on the cell phone, yeah, she just walked out of her house. Okay, I'm gonna you call me when she starts heading back, you know, because that's what they're doing now. They're using the cell phone technology to keep each other informed. And they watch for patterns of what you're doing because we are creatures of habit and we always tend to do the same thing. So I tell people with animals, if you're walking your dog, don't go at the same time, go different directions, even leave, go up the street, and go back past your home. Cross the street and go over and go around again. Confuse people, confuse the animals. Coyotes aren't wearing watches but they can detect patterns. That's why we have situations where someone calls up and says, I left for work and I put my dog out in the yard in the morning and came back and my dog was gone or deceased. Remember, if you have a little dog and six foot walls or five foot walls, they can't get out but other animals can get in. Now more often we get other domestic pets attacking domestic pets that way, getting into the yard from the neighbor. But coyotes do that also. They will dig under the fence and they will come over the fence or through the fence if it's wrought iron. So on the topic of fences, on average, with a five foot fence, if the ground is flat on either side, 
a coyote can often clear jump the fence 95 to 98% of the time. If it's a six foot fence, they almost always have to make contact with the top. Their front paws, they boost themselves over with their back legs. If the fence sits with an angled hillside going up at 45 degrees, even if it's eight feet, they might be able to stand up and jump over. They just may not be able to get back out. Coyotes will often walk on fences. Certain width, widths of fences or walls they'll walk right on top of and do what I call shopping. They'll look at every single yard to see what's food. This yard has fruit. This yard has the water I need. Oh, this one has pet food. And this one has a little tiny dog or cat. And they remember and they come back. Okay, so be aware of your fence. If your fence is not sitting on a foundation and on soil, they can dig underneath. So if you have that situation and you notice that there are marks indicating an animal's been digging under your fence, you might want to fill that. Please go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. You might want to go ahead and fill that space with either cinder block or pour a foundation underneath that fence. Come on in. For those of you with a wrought iron fence, Coyotes usually do not jump them because they cannot place their paws on the fence the right way to get over. They try to go in between. If you take your hand and stick it out in front of you and make a fist, and your iron bars touch either side of your hand, it's probably fine. But if you can go back and forth with a, with a half an inch on each side, your fence is probably wide enough for some coyotes to get through. Okay? And for digging underneath, you can put a skirt or an apron, which means piece of chain link, a roll that's three feet wide, a foot and a half up the fence, another foot and a half out, a foot and a half out that forms an L shape. So because coyotes don't know to come up and dig before that, they're going to come and dig right at the base of the fence. You can cover that with soil. That's another way of dealing with that. There's a device called the coyote roller, which can be attached to any type of fence. It freely rolls. People have made their own versions of this. This is a guy in uh, San Diego, ships this from his house. We tried to get it in Home Depot here. Home Depot says, we don't have any coyotes in LA. <laughs> yeah, I think they need some letters from us to let them know. We sell really well. Um, so the idea is to have different things in place. You don't have to necessarily go to those extents. Some people do pet enclosures. It was right in Silver Lake Echo Park border where I had a couple that built a pet enclosure after a coyote walked in the living room after the cat. Wow. Wife was washing dishes, heard a noise, turned around, the coyote was standing there, they looked at each other, the coyote ran back out. They know that they had coyotes, they built a wonderful enclosure, there are pictures of it here tonight in one of the, in one of the displays. Um, the, the enclosure it had a tunnel that went from the upstairs window out to the enclosure for the cats, it had a scratching post, a chair, it just it was wonderful. They felt safe because they did this for their cats. Some people don't have the space to do that. They do a smaller room. But you have to consider your options. What can you do to protect your pets? And it often happens when you're not home, when you have somebody that's a pet caretaker. I'm not putting down pet caretakers, but they don't know the ins and outs of everything going on at your home. So you may have them come, just say, let the dog out in the backyard and change the food. And while the dog's running in the backyard, something happens, whether it's a coyote, but the dog gets caught up in an inanimate object and starts getting hurt, which we have happen frequently. Because pet rescues from our department, from wildlife, are on the farthest bottom of the scale. It's usually the pet comes into contact with a dangerous object. The other thing is poison. The city is actively working to ban a lot of poisons that are used for poisoning rodents because the secondary poisoning of wildlife and domestic pets is high. You may not even know that your pet ingested a poison rodent and they get secondary poisoning. You're wondering what's going on. Why is your pet lethargic? Does it have one of the various pet diseases? Something else going on? The last thing most people ever even think about is the pet ate some sort of poison. A lot of animals are taking a big hit from poison. Bobcats, coyotes, mountain lions, birds of prey, they're all taking big hits from poison. It usually is indiscriminate and gets the non-target animal. Okay, So remember that. Uh, glue traps, if you're using them for rodents, um, personally I'm anti-glue trap, I think they should be banned because we get a lot of domestic pets with those glue traps stuck to them. We've had kittens, we had a hawk and a rat with the hawk and the rat with the glue trap stuck to the side of its head. Okay, Glue traps are horrible, 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 please do not use them. 
I can't order you to not use it, I'm just saying please do not. Um, but if you go with a trapper, because if you don't like our policies and the way we do things and you hire a company, do remember that their, their requirement is to let the animal out of the trap or kill it. Most of the time they catch a non-target animal. If they tell you they're going to take it to a place where it can live out its life and happiness, please let me know where that is because I'm moving. <laughs> okay, there is no such place. Now, I, I, a couple years ago, I caught a guy who was trapping animals out at Orchid Ranch way out in Roscoe on the valley near Valley Circle Boulevard, and he was trapping skunks and releasing them in Atwater Village. <laughs> Atwater Village is skunk central. So I asked him, I said, do you also contract to capture skunks in Atwater Village? And he said, yes, I do. So he said, yes, you're creating work for yourself by taking animals from one area to another and capturing the same animal again? He didn't even respond, I just turned him over to Fish and Game. He no longer has a license. Okay, so some of these guys, believe it or not, it's actually cheaper to let the animal go somewhere else than it is to kill it. It costs money to kill an animal because they only have a few choices. And most of these companies do not want to pay the fee to have their people trained for humane euthanasia. So be aware, if you have a guy trap an animal, they may kill it by putting it in a chamber with gasoline tubes. Okay? Or high, high altitude decompression. Just remember that. Ask them what their method is if you decide to go with that choice. And if they tell you, we don't kill and relocate them, that is not a trapper that is actually has a permit. Even if he shows you one, it's got to be fake. they got to have a permit for the Fish and Game or the State Pest Control Board. Do we have time to go to questions now? Yes, sir. Although I'd like to make a quick introduction. Uh, Roger Wilson, can you stand up, please? Roger's a Silver Lake resident. He's also uh, been appointed it's up to co for confirmation of the City Council tomorrow, I believe, yeah, yeah, to the uh, Animal Services Commission, and he's a Silver Lake resident, and he'll be presumably championing the cause of Silver Lake, but also of animals across the city. I, I live over on Silver Ridge Avenue. Um, my appointment isn't until, to, isn't until tomorrow morning, but I've been really excited about this. And tonight is just kind of the perfect thing for me to see. First of all, Officer Randall, who's fantastic. And, and he's <laughs> but it, it's wonderful to see the level of community involvement. And, I, and I, 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 it, it warms my heart to, to know that you're all out there trying to protect my dogs. Um, and I'm, I'm here to protect yours. And, and, and your families and, and, and to really be of any assistance I can. So I'm Roger Wolfson. If you look me up online, you can find my email address. If you need me for any reason, I'm here. Um, I'm not as knowledgeable as Officer Randall, but um, I might have some What's your new job? I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm one of the five commissioners for the City of Los Angeles for Animal Services. So the commissioners for Animal Services oversee the Department of Animal Services. We have um, our only authority goes through them. Um, we set policies for them. We also respond to queries from them. Um, but we're uh, it really um, another form of outreach for you, for the community. We're another form of good thinking, ideally, and also we're here to hear complaints and to try and respond to them <coughs> effectively. So thank you for your attention and back to us. And he does have to run because of, of what's coming up in tomorrow morning in council. So. I, I, I have one question. There are five commissioners and there's one officer. Is that right? <laughs> Actually, Officer Randall, we know more about the number of. Is that, is that correct? For, for a while, the, commissioners, all, the number of commissioners goes up and down all the time. Yeah, so. but the number of officers is. Right. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to know. Well, for, for, while, for a while, right? I mean, there's, other, there's obviously other employees for the Department of We have 65, I think, officers in total. We're supposed to have 120. So we have 30 minutes, actually 29 and a half for questions and comments. So I'm going to ask everyone who has a question to please keep it quick and also the answer. And I apologize in advance because I normally have a longer talk and go into the other animals, but for the sake of time, um, and uh, please try and keep it to one question so everyone can get their questions, and thank you very much. And, we'll and, start right and here. he has offered to stick around yes, afterwards. Yes, I will remain. I will remain, so please. Is it true that in our neighborhood, Is, it, is there anybody here who has had their pet killed on a leash? Um, I have because maybe, but a friend of mine has been killed on a leash. He's been really not in this
the dog survive? The dog survived. He had, he had a sense that he had to get the to the kitchen. He was fine, but he okay. was <laughs> Thank you for adding that. And just remember your leash is like your seatbelt for us. Having that leash on the dog will prevent often, even though an attack may take place, because we have dogs attack dogs on leashes more than anything, okay? Uh, but that leash may allow you to pull your dog away, protect your dog further. Sometimes it's a small dog, you can pull your dog up in your arms. So although attacks can happen on leash, the likelihood is smaller. You're less likely to have that happen. Part of the problem is even if you have a dog that's what they call Schutzen trained, you cannot guarantee that dog something won't cause it to run away from you or it may decide it's protecting you and chase something far away, ended up getting injured either by another animal or being hit by a car. So having your dog on leash close isn't necessarily a guarantee of nothing happening, but you're more likely to reduce it just like if you were your seatbelt in an accident. Did, did that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Right here? Yep. I've seen people about the reservoir feeding coyotes. What do we do with that? Okay, so that is a problem that we've had for a long time, and we finally got a law in place called Feeding of Non-Domesticated Mammalian Predators Prohibited. It carries with it a $500 to $1,000 fine and a possible six months in jail. The way the law was written, because a lot of people say, well, I wasn't trying to feed the coyote, the words cause to be fed. If you cause the animal to be fed through your neglect of feeding something else, it's still a violation of the law. Now, the park rangers are regularly citing people in Griffith Park for doing that. You have to see the violation happen in front of you. However, if there's a preponderance of evidence and photographic evidence of a violation ongoing at somebody's property, we can present it to the city attorney for filing. And we do have a case that's going on in Griffith Park right now where we discovered that a woman who doesn't even live in Griffith Park but not within a mile of Griffith Park has been paying somebody to go into Griffith Park and feed coyotes on purpose. Some private investigators are doing an investigation. They actually caught this activity and showed it to us and we were shocked. And it turned out to be an area where I've been getting reports of somebody feeding coyotes for about 10 years. I can never find out who it was. And now we know. The problem is getting the person to roll over on the, the main suspect who's paying for this to be done. By the way, paying somebody to commit a crime bumps that up from misdemeanor to a felony. Okay, so this is a big, it's conspiracy, correct. It's a big problem. It doesn't just happen there. I have locations here in Silver Lake and Echo Park where we've had people feeding wildlife. I've got a case up by the Hollywood sign right now where I've got video footage of the food. Fly you can see it flying off the hillside and the coyote's catching it before it even hits the ground. And I get that all over. I mean, I get, this is all over the city. No matter where it is, I get it all over. So that also makes it more difficult to resolve problems. But it is against the law. You can report it. We need the address who's doing it, or a license plate if someone's driving to the neighborhood. They have to be observed, putting down the food, and wild predators. Wild predators are opossums, skunks, raccoons, bears, coyotes, foxes. Did I say bobcats yet? But all the way up there. Rats and mice don't count. Cats don't count. Birds don't count. Wild mammalian predators. Remember, it's mammalian predators. Um, usually birds don't attack food that's stationary. That's, that's an important point, and that's something that came to light that we're reviewing the possibility of adding that in, you know, where it's causing predatory birds. But we have the bigger problem from feeding the, um, the animals which live outside, whether they're cats or something else, leading to the feeding of unwanted animals. If you don't want around your home, they have something to do. That's the big problem. I even have that situation right on the street. I mean, right on the street, it's been putting out wildlife. Mammalian predators. The mammals. Sorry. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay. Is there any money anywhere in your department for education? You know, I made three of them for the
Um, there is no money side like for education. We do public education. I don't actually come to school to talk to the third graders in the year. And separately from that, the Department of Fish and <laughs> we got a two-legged predator out here. You guys can come in, we're gonna close this. Sorry about that, folks. I've been attacked by an owl. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm speaking about real-life scenario where people have to go to work every day and take right. their kids and don't have time for two hours to spend sure. in a community. Right. That's, know, there's got to be a way to communicate. I've asked for it's the same program that Fish and Wildlife has where they have a team of volunteers. They're trained, and they go out to the community and provide information either door-to-door I need the information or if they need contact with somebody to get everything to the spot. Uh, right now, currently, unfortunately, there is no fund money or funding. Our department gets the last bits of money when the money is divvied and runs the city. We don't get anything. Well, so, Well, that's something that you should bring up to the commission meeting. You know, if you want to bring up that point. I mean, it's it's helpful also if you want to come to one of our commission meetings. They have an open comment section where you can actually bring that up, and that's documented, and they'll require that I respond to it. You know, and then they'll draft up a proposal from that. So that's a very good idea, I and mean, it's something that I've wanted for a long time. So you're preaching to the choir on that one. Thank you, by the way, for bringing that up. Yes. They're classified, they're classified as a nocturnal predator. However, coyotes are one of the few animals that adjust their behavior to suit their needs to find food. They're also crepuscular, meaning dusk and dawn. They come out early in the morning, late just as the sun's going down. The activity we get most amongst coyotes tends to be between the hours of like 9 p.m. and 4 a.m., just like some of the other ones. However, unlike the other true nocturnal predators like raccoons, comes possums. Coyotes are going to show up randomly at any time because sure, their need to find food often, is, especially if they may have young or a, uh, as a pregnant female, is going to require that they search at times that they normally wouldn't. And one of the things that I mentioned about the picking up on patterns, daytime sightings of a lot of wildlife and changes in behavior of wildlife has a lot to do with what we present as people. You know, that we set food out at certain times that might cause an attraction. That's why we tell people if you're feeding cats which live outdoors, try not to feed them from dusk to dawn. You know, daytime only, after 9 in the morning or before 4 in the afternoon. A lot of people find that difficult to do. The people that have changed that have found that the cat populations they're managing can last longer. They're like, it's rough on the coyotes. It doesn't mean other things won't happen. But that can make things different. But for nighttime actions from a coyote, daytime actions, it can be any time, but it's more particular at night. That help? So if I see a coyote at 10 o'clock in the morning, which I've seen. Right. It doesn't always mean that it's sick or injured, although it might. Uh, if you see a raccoon at 10 o'clock in the morning or a stump or a possum, that might require a better look because there could be something wrong with it or somebody may have just cured out of the den where it is. But a lot of times it's just the fact that the animal sort of. We have, uh, we have a bit less than 20 minutes and a lot of hands, so if everyone can kind of everything, everything move a little quicker because we do have to start the next meeting on Friday. Yes. Actually, people do put our information on their 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 council directory, like the Beachwood neighborhood council, different ones. There's a link to our program that tells about it. We actually have our wildlife Facebook that explains every different type of wildlife, wild animal now, so you can have a link on there if people have a question about it. Because a lot of the information, unfortunately, on our website right now is, is not tremendous because we don't have that much space. So we put it on the Facebook, which allows more action. But every single community that's doing that it's really helped because it's, I've, I've contacted people who said, yes, I've read your information on our community website, which that way I know it's getting out there. So a link to it, 
uh, doing email blasts, you know, when there's act wildlife activity in the neighborhood, all of that stuff can be very helpful. Yes, sir. There are a couple of known food sources in the neighborhood for coyotes, like the dumpster behind the grocery store, a food truck that allows a lot of trash overnight to hang out on the streets. What are the recourse in those kinds of instances when we know coyotes are trying to clean up those sources? One of the things that, well, there's a couple of different things there. For example, places, stores, schools, any business that has any food often has, not all, but often has some sort of food source in an open dumpster. They don't like to close the dumpster because it's easier to throw food in. We do recommend that they close it. We can't make them do it. Also, to police all the food and things that fall out around the outside. Um, there's always going to be a food source attraction. I mean, they can do a 50% ammonia, 50% water spray in the trash to kill the odor of food. But again, that's not mandatory. That's something they can do to reduce that. And then the, that's about the businesses with the dumpsters and bins. And then for food trucks and things like that that show up, I don't know what the regulations are that govern them. I think that they should be required to police their food, that they, that people are buying food from them and throwing it on the ground. Maybe when they set up their truck, they should also set up a trash can next to it and take away anything that's, you know, instead of people just tossing it around like that. That's a difficult one, you know, because I don't have any say in that, but it is part of the problem. It's a huge, it's a huge part of the problem. I, I, do, want, I do want to say that I know Brett over here, on behalf of the neighborhood, Wash, you can come this way, uh, went to Ralph's, did invite them here, it was today, and, and uh, we will definitely go back, and I'm hoping, I know Mary Rodriguez is here, of Mr. O'Farrell's office, maybe uh, that office, and maybe Tom Labonte's office would be uh, willing to join with us and go and really have a discussion with Ralph's, and I think in particular, but maybe other stores, to convince them that this is a problem that they can help resolve significantly. Is there anyone? I'm not. I guess I should put you on the spot about working at Ralph's. Never mind. Yes. Um, what do you do your dog? Because it's walking Ashley and she's saying, I can't. Maybe like you talk to my block and I don't want to be around like this one pound little dog. Right. So should you pick them up? If your dog is. Holding the dog? If your dog is, is of size where you can pick it up, that's best. I can't guarantee that's going to work if you've got somebody's stray large domestic dog. But with a coyote, when you pick up your dog and it's up like this, a lot of times for the ant, for a coyote, that's a very confusing behavior, and they're seeing what looks like a beam with two heads. Okay, so you're basically making yourself look really big by picking up your dog, if you could do so. If you have a large dog, the bigger problem is will your large dog pull away from you, you know, and try and go after the coyote. But keep your leash taut as close as possible if you can't pick your dog up. Do not use those extending leashes. They are illegal. Tell you right now, they are. Once the leash goes beyond six feet, you can still get a ticket because the leash law length is six feet. There's no disclaimers on those leashes. Just remember that if you're using one of those, they're also not really that strong. I mean, we're talking about a difference in the thickness of what's controlling your dog. A lot of people have those on very big dogs, and we've had those things snap. We've had reports of those things snapping and dogs getting away from people. Also, remember. And since we're on the subject of leashes again, what you can do with your leash, but there's no one out there training people on how to hold the leash. But I'll tell you right now that when you're walking a dog on leash, this, walking your dog like this with two fingers, is not it. Okay? The leash is meant to go over your hand, and then you hold on to it like this. That is the proper way to use a leash. Any other way is not the proper way. This not only gives you control of the, the leash, but if you have to free your hand to do something like grab something else, you're still holding the leash. Okay, so remember, holding the leash, keep your dog close, make sure it's six feet, and get your dog prepared. If you're going to scare a coyote when it comes close to you, do some of the scare tactics in your dog's presence so you're not freaking your dog out. Because basically when a coyote comes, you're going, ah! or clapping your hands, or if you have a jacket, you can take it off and wave it over your head. You want to make yourself appear to be larger. Carry that whistle or an air horn. Blow the whistle or air horn near your dog, not near his ears, but near the dog so that the dog gets used to it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, first of all, I've been to Ralph's. I live, I live in the 2500 block of Silver Lake Boulevard. I have been in constant communication with Ralph, with the property management, complaining about the dumpsters because the coyotes are on my street, like right. across from me. Um, 
my concern and my neighbor's concern, we have a lease that can connect to three, you told me, probably three to five in our little area. They're getting ready to get burnt. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that we're now going to possibly be overrun because even if five are born, now we're up to 10 coyotes. And I kind of feel like, I mean, I understand we need to be told how to deal with it. I should not feel like a lunatic running out to the umbrella if they're young. They run, they stop, they look at me, they come back. So our right. street, we're very concerned about that. Right. And some of my neighbors are here. One of the things that happens, which is, I'm glad you brought that up, is a behavior that happens with coyotes that have a constant access to a local food source. And they become what we call emboldened. They become very used to that food activity. They associate more people with food. And they have less fear of people, so frightening them is much more complicated. Okay, now, we used to have a paintball gun that we used for scaring away coyotes. We do not have it while they're reviewing the, the policy on that. The paintball gun was for the tough case coyotes. We did a rump shot, no shots to the head or anything like that. It was a negative deterrent. We don't want to injure them, but then we found that that worked very well for the coyotes that weren't responding to what you tried to do. The other thing that I would like to try and do, especially in your neighborhood, time permitting, um, is to walk with you, at the t be there at the times the coyotes are showing up, be there with you and do the scare tactics with you. Because sometimes it's the way in which the scare tactics are presented. Coyotes do know if you mean it. If you are not sure of yourself and really, really forceful, that animal, especially one that's become accustomed to a food, food source, may stake, stake out the area more, I don't know, aggressively, so to speak. Not that they're going to be more aggressive towards you, but they're going to be more emboldened and less likely to run away. But there are uh, times when I've been in Griffith Park because of the food where I have coyotes have come up and sat down and begged in front of me. <laughs> okay. I was in Griffith Park years ago, you know, in the beginning of the wildlife program, doing a patrol because we had a problem with somebody feeding them there. And I, I, there's a guy sitting at a bench reading a paper, and I thought his dog was curled up next to him with a coyote. <laughs> and I said, you don't know that's a coyote? He goes, yeah, it's there every day. <laughs> it didn't even matter to him because it's, it's always curled. I said, are you feeding it? He said, no, it just always curls up here. But I found evidence of food around the brent, bench. He said he didn't throw it there. In the incidents where we've had people that have been injured by a coyote, 99% of the time, in my opinion, it's been because of food being introduced. Either the person that was feeding it or the person that just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, has been nipped by a coyote. Not mauling, but nipped like a notification, hey, where's my food? Okay, in the incident we had in Griffith Park in 2009 over by Travel Town, we had two people bitten three, pe three weeks apart. Each person received a singular puncture wound, very tiny. The exact same set of circumstances. Both had their shoes off, both were napping on the grass, both on the top of the right foot. So the coyote has a foot fetish, I guess. It's <laughs> <laughs> weird. But anyway, as a result of that, fishing game removed nine coyotes from Griffith Park. They did not remove any coyotes that ran from them, only the ones that came up and begged food. Okay, we don't want to have to have an animal die as a result of a human doing something they shouldn't be doing. Okay, that's why we don't want people to feed them. They don't need our help. They, are, they have a job to do to keep our rodent population in check. But along the lines of the birth rate and the overpopulation of coyotes, Remember that I said there's a 67% mortality rate from birth to adulthood. The majority of these coyotes are not going to survive, especially the ones that are crossing through some of these streets. We all know how the street down here can get sometimes. They'll get coyotes hit by cars, they get killed. I mean, it, it's not gonna be a constant amount of coyotes. I always find that the population goes up in this time of year and significantly drops off around September through October. It just it seems to always be a cycle. The population of coyotes in the city of Los Angeles is between four and 7,000 at any given time. So 4,000 on the low end, 7,000 on the high. The entire state of California, 250 to 750,000 throughout the year, up and down. Now, if you remember 2007, we had the Griffith Park fire. A lot of coyotes died. Youngsters died because they were too young. There was a time when they were giving birth. The fire happened at the time when they were in their den, so many coyotes died. And bobcats and deer and other animals. So remember, there's always going to be something that, even though they're born, that's going to be taking them out. But you and I have to talk more at another time. And I'll, I'll, one, yeah. one minute, uh, and we only have about eight minutes, but I do want to say that you have two city council offices here, you have neighborhood council represented here, you have this neighborhood watch here, and I think we all can speak to uh, Ralph's together. So I want to ask, would everyone here like 
for some of those voices to contact Rouse and try to pressure them into being a little bit more vigilant. Everybody who feels that way, would you please raise your hand? Thank you. I, I can go back there and take pictures of some of the stuff and forward that up to city council and say this is part of our problem. So we have like seven minutes, so if we can do it real quickly. Yes, sir. So um, here's a question, and I apologize if I'm covering territory that was already spoken about here earlier. The four to 7,000 population at any given time. Yes, sir. I've been in LA a long time, living out here on Waverly, Waverly Drive. The population has exploded over the last 10 to 15 years. So if the four to 7,000 number is from, you know, now is the same as it was in the 1990s, not that you're saying that, but I know that the population has at least tripled or more than that now than it was, say, 20 years ago. I'd like to see LA, and maybe this is a matter of us, you know, lobbying our council offices four and 13 to do something, but I'd like to see some kind of program to either relocate these coyotes. Yeah. I know there are people who don't like that. You missed or, out on that part of the song. All right, well, but there isn't enough, I mean, if, if all it is is about scare tactics, just scaring them away, that's not the, so that's not a solution. Okay, so let me go to, let me just address part of what you're saying if I can. Okay, the population moves around. They don't, it's not static in one location all the time. They don't find the food they're seeking, they go elsewhere. Some people call me up and say, did you come to remove coyotes because I'm not seeing them anymore? No. If animals don't find what they need, they move out. I've got a guy up in Sunland who said he has, for the first time because of the drought in 30 years, seen nothing. He, was, he saw coyotes every day. I'm seeing nothing. I'm just saying that. But the, the, as far as the moving, the moving of the animals, there is no relocation of urban wildlife. There are two choices. Death. Yep. or let it out of the trap if it's caught. There is no relocation. So if people want to, separately from our department, contract with pest control, they're entitled to do that, and the animals will either be killed or let out of the trap, depending on the type of animal it is. You can stay after the meeting and talk to me. I'll stay, okay. stick around and answer your questions if other people need to. We have like five minutes, so. If you no. have asked a question, please let somebody else. Yes. I'm just wondering about the actual R-bar of a coyote. Good, good point. One to five people per year per state are attacked by a coyote, with the majority of them inducing the attack by trying to be the animal. Right. And so. my, I just a little, I live in the community, I've lived here for 15 years, I live on Lake Deep Terrace, I see coyotes all the time, all day long. I have two small dogs, both are on 12 pounds wet, and I just, I don't really understand the sense of coyote hysteria that's going on in our community right now. They've been here all along. One of, the, one of the things that we're fighting is fear. Same fear. Okay, fear is created often by the vilification of... <laughs> fear, I have an acronym that I use for fear, which some of you have heard it. Face everything in the cover or forget everything in the room. Okay, we have a choice. There's a lot of things that keep us in fear. If we go in the ocean, there's things in there we can't see and we still go in. Okay, there are animals that can attack in the ocean. God knows we didn't think Steve Irwin was going to get killed by Stingray. We thought it was going to be a croc or an alligator. You never know what it's going to be. Um, you know, there is a lot of fear about the animal because the media hypes it up. Trappers for years have hyped up what a coyote can do. That we have two trappers that go around and actively tell people that a coyote can pick up a 70-pound dog and clear a six-foot fence. Yeah. That is super coyote. It is not possible. I had people that call me up saying they heard that and they're scared. Officer Randall, I've got a 120-pound Great Dane. I'm frightened because the guy told me that coyote can lift it over the fence. I leave. That's what I do out of this job. And coyotes can start lifting 120-pound dogs over the fence. But there's a lot of things. I mean, you may be the person that's walking the dog and not have something happen. Then a week later, someone in the exact same spot has the opposite situation. So we have to deal with each thing. Every person is going to have their own personal feelings. 
And I welcome all points of view, whether you hate coyotes or love coyotes, we have to talk about it and come up with an idea. But your, your point's very valid, that, the, that yes, there's, there is a lot going on, there is a lot of hype, there's a lot of people upset, but there's a lot of reasons that people are sent that direction. And I'm hoping that I can address a lot of that. But they're smart animals and they, and they hunt in packs. So we have to learn how to deal with them as they do um, hunt in, 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 in a pack. They're, and they're, uh, um, uh, uh, one thing is the, the one in front of you is going to uh, make its noise, but the one in back of you, the way they hunt is by attacking your heel, your Achilles heel, so you can't run. So that's the first thing they attack. So learning how they attack is, is the, our knowledge is what's going to save us. Not I, I'm not going to agree with you 100% because about coyotes are not pack animals. Well, they, 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 they attack within a pack. If you go up into Griffin Park, you can hear them attacking the deer in the bushes. That's a misnomer. They do not celebrate or make noise when they're attacking. The last thing they want to do well, is no, attract something. They, 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 they make noise when, they, when, when, they're, when they're feeding off of an animal because they're, they're all... Okay, yeah, we really do want to move. You can talk to me afterwards. Let's get to the like questions. One minute, no more, because we have 30 second answers. If we can do that. Right here. And this gets the next five. I would just like to I say, I'm from Laurel Canyon. I trapped, trapped, and rehabilitated a coyote that had sarcastic mange in our neighborhood. And I will tell you, the entire neighborhood got together. You can get together to log. You can, you can start a Twitter feed where you can say where the coyotes are so you can haze them. But without fail, these animals show up because humans do the wrong thing. Right. You should go to your stores, and this also has to do with rodenticides, rat poison. Stores like Safeway and Ralph, you have to get them to clean up their, their uh, uh, what you call it, dumpsters. They put out bait boxes at their dumpsters, which bring in rats, which eat the bait, and then they're called anticoagulant rodenticides. Takes the animal three weeks to die. They bleed to death internally. It's horrible. But it slows them down. Coyotes, raptors, eat them. And you don't have any more raptors. Then you have more rats. So it all goes to your food source. If there's food, they'll do it. So I'm just saying, go to your stores and force them to clean up. Best thing you can do. Can we do these final, I see three questions here. Maybe foremost, but if you can do like 30 seconds each. Yeah, I just want to thank you for your When there, are, when there are things that aren't enforceable by myself, I often turn to building and safety or sanitation for things that, like the trash and all the other stuff that's enforceable. But it should be against the law for the route, not to have enough point about allow their dumpsters to be pulled for that huge haul, and that needs to be against the law, and there needs to be a policy regulating that. That's a good point. Uh, and I have two more questions, but I do want to comment. Administrator's Code Enforcement called ACE. The city is introducing, including on a pilot basis, which will change how some call them lesser violations are policed. It's a pilot program that's going to be initiated soon in animal services and also in LAPD. And it's a way basically I got a ticketing, but each time the ticket goes up in price. So it's meant to actually not stick something into the vortex as well as under the reports, but to actually provide some sort of concrete and swift enforcement tool. Okay, two, I saw two more, I think. One here, quickly, please. Okay. Um, so I've been dealing with uh, gophers and wolves. And something's been digging, trying to keep them. And I thought I'd reinforce my fences enough to keep the coyotes out. Um, but do raccoons uh, and, and skunks also go after those? Yes, they do. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that's what I'm seeing is no change. Right. Uh, uh, there, yeah, those are animals with all Yes, You're absolutely correct. Okay, correct. Was there one more question I saw? Uh, no? Okay, so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Just a quick comment. This was when I was passing out the flyers. A few homeowners asked me to ask the individuals here, 
those of us who own dogs and those of us who walk our dogs, please do not dispose of your dog's waste in a private trash can. It's rude for the homeowner. It's a horrible surprise come trash day. Please put it in a public trash can or take it home and put it in your own trash can. Sticking around, I would like to invite everyone to be here for the next meeting, which is a neighborhood council committee meeting. But also, if you haven't signed the neighborhood watch here uh, form, just to put your name and email address. It will not be shared with anybody, but so you can be alerted about meetings like this. If you haven't signed yet, please sign here. Uh, also, I don't want anyone to clear out if they want to talk to me and just stay for their other meeting. If you can't find enough brochures here, it's on our uh, wildlife Facebook, City of Los Angeles wildlife program on Facebook. The note section has all the animals with pictures of how to deter and all that. Thank you very much. For that.